A very warm welcome to all of you. It's so exciting to see where you're joining from today, from all across Europe. Um, welcome to the webinar, Saving the Climate um, with Agriculture. I will be giving a quick introduction just now um, about um, the speakers, uh, about the webinar itself. Um, we will have then two presentations, um, 15 minutes each, so not too long, hopefully. And then we have enough time for you to ask questions later. Um, and then we aim to finish in an hour and a half. So we will be finished uh, at 8.30 Central European time. Um, so my name is Anna Marie. I'm a campaigner with We Move Europe based in Berlin in Germany. And I've been working on agriculture, but also on protecting our forests and on stopping fossil fuels. And as many as of you know, and um, I assume you are part of the WeMove community, we are now uh, 1 million people across Europe, which is super exciting. And we're building people power to really transform Europe in the name of our community, uh, rather than corporations, um, and in the name of future generations and the planet. And as part of that, we've been running the agricultural campaign um, to stop the cap the common agricultural policy. And I know many of you have been supporting this. Um, unfortunately, the EU decided again um, to finance industrial farms that use a lot of fertilizers um, and pesticides um, and are really not uh, good for our biodiversity uh, nor for our climate. Um, and this is a big package again that has been agreed, which will be in place for seven years. Um, so this is really bad from the campaigning side, but we saw that so many of you are very interested in this topic um, and were very engaged. Um, and we wanted to look at if this is really bad agriculture, what is good agriculture? Um, so this was the spark, the idea to start off with a webinar where we can meet and learn a little bit more about regenerative agriculture and also agroforestry which is combining uh, trees uh, and fields and crops. Um, and then maybe um, as part of WeMove, we can um, kickstart a new campaign in the fall time. We're just working on that, but um, we wanted to really start um, with this webinar and dive a little bit deeper. So today we will be hearing from Fabio Volkmann, um, not from Ivo as introduced. Ivo can't make it because he's traveling. So we're really happy to have Fabio here. Um, and he is the head of technology and community at Climate Farmers. And Climate Farmers, um, he will talk more about it, I'm sure, but um, they have the mission to build the necessary infrastructure to really scale regenerative agriculture across Europe. Uh, he will start uh, in a little bit with his presentation. And then we will also hear from Nick Jacobs. And uh, Nick is the director of IPIS Food. IPIS stands for the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. So as the name says, um, Nick has been working on sustainable food production. And for me personally, I've been uh, working uh, on agriculture um, for, for um, about half a year now um, as part of, um, of other campaigns. And I was absolutely inspired um, to hear about the potential that regenerative agriculture has and that re, um, agroforestry has. So the combination of trees um, and crops, because a lot of times we really think um, that there is a trade off between farmers interests and the environment. Um, but we can really imagine um, to produce healthy foods and tackle the issues that we're facing right now. We are facing climate heating, soil erosion, water pollution. We're losing our birds and uh, insects and that we all depend on. So can we re imagine a farm that is highly productive and is, a, is also hosting um, a healthy ecosystem? And this idea of regenerative agriculture and agroforestry, which is part of this, is obviously not a new idea. Um, for thousands of years, um, farmers and people have been combining uh, using trees um, on their land, um, for example, to protect crops uh, in Western Europe. 
but farms have farmers have been really incentivized to cut down trees, um, especially as part of, of the green revolution in the 60s. But we can still see example of this across the world. You can combine uh, a vineyard and, and sheep, have sheep there, or you can grow vegetables under coconut trees in, in Tanzania. So there's lots of examples and, and farmers that are still doing this. And studies have shown amazing potential of this. Um, you can increase the profitability of the farm when you're using agroforestry. Um, you're, you're increasing the diversity, um, also increasing um, the diversity of income. Say if one of your crops fails, you maybe have an alternative. Um, you increase production because you're going vertically. You can, for example, combine walnuts and wheat. So you use more space on the farm. Um, hedges can create a habitat for birds and insects. Um, the trees can, as mentioned, be windbreakers and really protect the, the fields. And the roots of the, of the trees um, can stop erosion uh, and, of course, um, absorb a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and really um, help us uh, to reduce um, climate um, extremes, climate heating. So the potential is really great. I'm super excited about it that we are here together today. You are here and that we can spread these uh, wonderful ideas um, that have so much potential really. And let's see how we can um, really impact Europe um, with, this, with this wonderful ideas. And yeah, I would like to, um, as mentioned, just some housekeeping rules. If you could mute yourself during the presentation, that, that would be great. Um, it's great to see your faces. Please feel free to keep your camera on. Um, and as mentioned, if you have questions that are popping up during the presentation, please feel free to already just write them in the chat. And then Lucia, my great uh, colleague who's here today to help as well, um, she will help to, to manage your questions after the presentations. So I would like to um, hand over to Fabio to, um, to start off. Fabio from Climate Farmers, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks Anna-Marie. And yeah, welcome everyone around the globe. Um, thanks for joining. Um, so my name is Fabio and I thought maybe I'm gonna start off with um, introducing myself personally to you uh, before going into regenerative agriculture and climate farmers. Um, so I am living in Berlin. Um, my journey was studying uh, mechanical engineering, always with the urge of um, changing something in the world, having an impact on our ecosystems, um, changing something in the system. Um, then I focused from mechanical engineering on environmental science and renewable energies, so solar and wind energy. Um, but kind of saw during my studies the profit orientation and I always had the urge of like working holistically, integrating different fields, um, being um, transdisciplinary and integrating um, policymakers, science, companies, um, individuals, citizen scientists in order to make decisions. Um, so I actually ended up with agriculture from like uh, doing a permaculture course in Portugal. Um, so I got introduced into like the whole world of permaculture and kind of adapted this to my life and then found out that actually agriculture is something uh, where we can have an impact, where I can have an impact. Um, so I saw agriculture as the source of the problem together with the political um, system and the decisions um, that were made but also as a solution for the problem. So this is like how I ended up working with climate farmers. So I was the third member of climate farmers um, and we focus, yeah, as uh, Anna-Marie said already, at building the infrastructure to scale regenerative agriculture. And I'm gonna share my screen with you. So like this, you have a little bit of visual um, visuals and also you can see along the line, um, yeah, some text like what we're working on. Um, so climate farmers building the infrastructure to scale regenerative agriculture. So infrastructure, we are not building cars, we are actually connecting different dots around the system. 
And this is how we actually um, worked with climate farmers. We were analyzing what are the problems around the current agriculture system and how can we uh, find solution for, solutions for these problems. Before starting this, I think there are some um, words that are maybe um, not so common and not so used by all of us. So I wanted to introduce you first to the term regenerative agriculture. So, as um, already proposed, there's like some practices that are considered as regenerative agriculture. So going along the line, um, I'm just gonna change to the laser pointer. So here on the left side, we see the first um, practice considered as regenerative agriculture. So minimizing soil disturbance and fertilizer application. This is, these are kind of guidelines that guide us through how to apply regenerative agriculture. So minimizing soil disturbance and fertilizer application is overall good for our ecosystem. So this is, this is the first pillar actually of regenerative agriculture. Then we go towards maximize diver, di diversity. So actually introducing different crops, introducing different animals, introducing different uh, systems that increase diversity, biodiversity on the animal scale, but also on a crop scale. The third one is keep the soil covered. So this guideline is actually focusing on bringing us together on having, having vegetation and plants always on our soils. Because if we don't have them covered, we have them uh, left bare. And like this um, uh, carbon dioxide is exposed and we have more erosion, wind erosion, water erosion. So um, one, guide, one guidance here is keep the soil covered. The next one is maintaining living root uh, year round. So this is connected with the third one, actually keeping the soil covered with either plants um, or other materials and um, then having, um, having roots all year round. So like this, we have more structure in the soil. The, the fifth one here is integrating animals. So we are trying to mimic nature as it is. So our, our agriculture, how it is uh, in modern society is that we are planting uh, systems that are not natural. So uh, natural systems would work with animals and plants together. So in regenerative agriculture, it's considered to integrate animals together with plants and not have them separated. And the last, and, um, the last one in the chain is work within context. So uh, regenerative agriculture is actually looking at um, individual cases. So we can't find one solution that fits all. We always need to consider where do you live? What is your um, purpose in life? What do you want to achieve? How do you want to interact with nature? So this is the last one, work within context. So if we are looking at the different ecosystem benefits and like how we contribute with um, regenerative agriculture to the overall ecosystem health, we actually have the first primary benefit, soil organic carbon. So all of us um, are aware of the carbon and like carbon in the atmosphere and the greenhouse gases that also lead towards um, climate change. Um, and so um, one of the things that we look at uh, within regenerative agriculture is actually to use soil organic carbon in the soil to have a fertile soil. I'm going to get deeper into um, the function of carbon in the soil later on in this presentation. The, then what we as climate farmers want to also highlight within our society and within decision making that carbon is not the most important value here. So we are looking actually at ecological values and ecosystem health parameters. So we uh, take into, into account plant health, soil health, biodiversity, water infiltration and retention. So what always helped for me is looking at regenerative agriculture, not as a set of practices. So you can't have like um, just a list of practices that you apply uh, somewhere in the world and then you do regenerative agriculture. It's more um, a mindset. So kind of you look at an ecosystem and if you have regeneration taking place in the ecosystem over time, you actually apply regenerative agriculture. So it's for us, it's more an outcome based um, scenario where you look at the results that you create as a farmer rather than looking at the practices that you use. And this is like something that we want to move forward to create with the society 
uh, definition on, on an outcome on an outcome based guideline that leads us towards regenerative agriculture and regeneration of ecosystems. Um, and this doesn't include or exclude any other farming system. So we don't want to create new drawers or new sections here. We want to include all farmers and look at ecosystems and how can you actually do land management for a certain time and leave, um, leave the land in a better state as it used to be before. So imagine you work on the land for 10 years and after 10 years, 10 years you stop uh, working with the land, but actually nature is thriving and you have a higher biodiversity, better water quality, better soil health. And this is what we see as regenerative agriculture. So soil health um, is actually sustaining life of plants, animals and humans. So this is like how we see soil health. And this is a part of regenerative agriculture that connects agriculture, soil science, uh, to policy stakeholder needs and sustainable uh, supply chain uh, management. So actually regenerative agriculture is also connecting the different parts and stakeholders of our society and brings them together. So it is translating science into land management and translate ma land management into science. So we have, to, we have a bridge in between. We have not a clear separation between those two. And now you might wonder why is carbon so important? So carbon is the main component of soil organic matter and soil organic matter is um, the organic, organic matter that we have in the soils. So it can be plant matter, it can be matter from, uh, plant, uh, from animals that is left and uh, the main component of this is carbon. And it's a very important um, factor that we look at also while looking at um, soil health because it gives uh, water retention capacity, it gives the structure to the soil and its fertility. So if we have um, a high amount of carbon in the soil, we can actually relate to a high, highly fertile soil. But we also need to look at, um, as I mentioned before, ecological values that also go along with um, carbon. So plant health, biodiversity, water infiltration that are not just connected to carbon, but also to different indicators and parameters. So with different stakeholders at the moment, Climate Farmers is working on a list of different parameters that we can use as a representation for, um, yeah, for the different ecosystem health um, or if the different ecosystem functions. Um, so how is carbon stored in the soil? So we can introduce carbon through uh, crop residues. So crop residues is like any parts of the plant that uh, fall on the ground and then they're integrated in the soil. So they bring carbon in the ground. Then we have carbon sequest uh, sequestration and mineral mineralization by microorganisms. So we can actually take carbon from the atmosphere and integrate it into the soils. Then carbon sequestration by root uh, exudates. So there's different sources of carbon in the ground. And I don't want to go into depth here, but for you, it should be just an introduction of like, how, what are the sources of carbon? What is carbon actually? And how is carbon incorporated into the soil? Um, so I mentioned already that carbon is one part of, um, of ecosystem functions and uh, soil functions. So what are these soil functions? So we have the first soil function as the primary pro productivity of food production. So if we are looking at agriculture, we always look at productivity. So how much, um, what is the yield that we gain? How much do we produce with our agriculture system? And this is one of the soil functions. The next one is water purification and regulation. As mentioned before, soil uh, water quality and the water cycling as a whole represented by the arrows. So if we have rain and then the water infiltrates through uh, to the groundwater. So how good is actually the soil taking up the water? How much is the water purif purified? And this is part of a soil function that is very important to look at. Next one is carbon storage and regulation. As mentioned before, super important soil function, but just, um, just one part of all soil functions and ecosystem functions. Um, the next one is provision of habitat for biodiversity. So actually we want to have a soil that is able to inhibit um, biodiversity and inhibit microorganism, but also be um, a base for actually uh, animals living on the ground and feeding them with all the, uh, all the vegetation and all the plants growing out of the soil. If we have a fertile and healthy soil, we can produce more food. We can have more grass feed animals. And that's like one of the goals of soil function. 
And the last one is cycling and provision of nutrients. So we don't just want to look at um, creating a lot of yield and looking at how much uh, kilo of yield we have, but also how much, how much, how many nutrients do we have in the yield? Um, we, yeah, we want to create very healthy food with our um, agriculture system. And these are the five uh, soil functions that we want to highlight within the regenerative agriculture. So it's not about the practices, it's about like what we create with this set of practices. So looking at the problems, at the moment, 25% of the an annual anthrop anthropogenic greenhouse gases is reduced uh, through agriculture. So that's a one big problem that we look at. Four, uh, four of nine planetary boundaries have been crossed. So climate change, loss of bio, biosphere in integrity, land system change, altered um, biochemical cycles. And climate change has already uh, taken up speed and um, affected food security due, due to warming, changing um, precipitation patterns and greater frequency of extreme water, weather events, as we see now with the floods and it's happening around our, uh, in our neighborhoods. So it's nothing that's just far away, it's actually happening in front of our doors. And why is this still something that is so, um, Yes, immensely happening and um, exponentially growing actually around the world. I'm just highlighting here a few of the problems um, that lead us towards um, the main agriculture problems that I mentioned here. So the first one is the policy failure and the policy implementation gap. So actually the subsidy system that we have is one of the problems why we still have such a big industrial or um, conventional agriculture scene in Europe or around, around the globe. So the subsidies are let at the moment. The more land you have, the more money you get. It's not about the more sustainable you farm or the more regeneration you produce. It's more about, okay, you have more land, you get more money. Um, so this is one of the problems that lead towards um, the big part of uh, industrial agriculture and the destructive agriculture to be in Europe, to be around the globe. The second one is the missing awareness for the potential of regenerative agriculture. But actually, people are not aware uh, of like the that we can still uh, have the small scale thoughts of regenerative agriculture that you do maybe in a community, but you can actually scale it up and you can feed the world with this. And it needs to be quantified. And that's like what the second problem here. There's a lack of appreciation for, for farmers' work. The farmers are positioned very low in our society, and their work is not appreciated as it should be. They are the ones feeding us and they are the ones fighting uh, climate change for us, but they are the ones earning the less and the least. And they are the ones working seven days, uh, 365 days a year. So we should appreciate the work. And this is also what we do with climate farmers. We give the boys back to farmers around the world. The third one is lack of knowledge and financial resources. So we had one farmer um, close by Hamburg and he had 700 hectares. He wanted to transition to regenerative agriculture, but there was not an example in Europe, like how to do it actually. How can I transition a monoculture wheat plantation, 700 hectares to regeneration? And he didn't know, he didn't have any resource of knowledge, but also no financial resources. It's, it's imagine you change your job from one day to another, and then you want to invest into this like change. It is like a big investment and farmers can't have this investment. They don't get the financial support for doing it. Um, it's more seen like if people ask for, I want to apply agroforestry or silver pasture on my land, um, they don't get this, this financial support from the state or for, from politicians because it's not recognized as, um, as a sustainable practice or like something that can lead towards regeneration. The fourth problem is monopolization of data. So actually transparency. We have a lot of data that is out there from institution, academy, uh, academics, but you can't access it. So if you try to find soil data from your farm or from your field around your door, try it. Um, I, I'm challenging you. Um, it's really hard actually. So we, uh, yeah, we faced a lot of problems and also farmers facing it a lot. The fifth is explainability. The complex is not comprehensible. And that's also what we saw that is happening around the world. Um, we try to communicate all of the, because there's like this high technology, AI, everybody's working with machine learning, nobody's understanding it. Um, so we want to bridge it. We want to explain it and to create a system where we have pro procedures technologies, data, results are understandable for everyone, for land managers, but also for the society as a whole. And at the moment, you have a lot of scientific papers. Um, 
academics can read it, people who studied can re read it, but I give, if I give it to my mom, uh, she wouldn't be able to like understand it completely. So we want to bridge it and we need to bridge it. We need to explain things in easy, understandable languages and uh, translate them into other languages because all the knowledge that is out there is available in English uh, mostly. Um, but what is if a farmer in Serbia wants to like uh, read it, but he never learned English before, yeah, we need to kind of bridge this problem. And this is also what we do with climate farmers. So I'm going to explain you a little bit climate farmers work. I need to wrap it up, I guess. Um, so we actually created Climate Farmers Academy, where we um, created a platform for um, free, accessible, open source knowledge that everybody in the world can use. Um, so we want to give you um, knowledge uh, for your specific context for free because we believe that uh, knowledge that can help us to actually regenerate ecosystems and lead towards a better future should be for free and that's what we do with the climate farmers academy so we are building this knowledge library that is free accessible and um, can be used from anybody around the globe because we saw the problem that is there is a lot of knowledge out there but it's not like there's a farmer in sweden showing uh, how to do agriculture and the farmer in senegal is trying to apply these practices but doesn't work because this climate zone is like completely different so we want to source this out and bring the knowledge that you need to you um the monitoring part is looking actually can jump up jump here the monitoring part is actually looking at quantification of x system so we want to communicate the benefits of uh, regenerative agriculture to policymakers, to businesses, to the society as a whole, but also to farmers. And with this, we can actually create financial instruments. So far, for climate farmers is looking at uh, financially supporting farmers um, with carbon plus credits, but also while um, redistributing the subsidies. So actually showing the benefits and then changing the whole system in order to um, give the give farmers the financial support from uh, from the governments, and this is like um, what is in need and what we see as one of the urgent points. Um, here, I just highlighted again the monitoring solution that we created. So we are sourcing a lot of different technologies and data that is out there, integrated into a platform, and then create different solutions that are communicated with different stakeholders. So climate farmers is. Uh, in contact with a lot of partners out there, aggregating the ideas, the technologies, bring them together and giving this out to all the different stakeholders in different forms and shapes. And this is yeah, kind of uh, symbolized here. I don't want to go into depth here, but there's a lot of um, yeah, technology uh, innovation here and bring different, combining different technologies to create results that are yeah, that you can use to represent um, nature, but nature is a complex system that is very hard to uh, represent in uh, numbers. Um, but this is like why, how we kind of can um, combine different technologies in order to just like create an image, a blueprint of what is happening on the ground. Um, so climate farmers at the moment, um, we have 500 farmers on our, in our community, they're in strong contact. Then what we did, we created an open source community. Um, so we believe that um, technologies should be open source and should be replicated by people around the globe in order to create regeneration. Then we have a first um, farm, um, a farm the database where we actually source all the data in order to create different um, solutions. So here, for example, the first um, uh, certif um, certificate customers confirmed. We're working with a lot of different experts and are in exchange with policymakers in order to also create an outcome based definition of regenerative agriculture. So this is like kind of um, you and at the beginning of this um, presentation, you might have wondered what is this infrastructure, but this um, slide is showing you kind of the different parts that we work on. So we try to combine different uh, technologies, work with different stakeholders create solutions in order to um, yeah, solve problems from farmers and the agriculture system as it is um, at the moment. Um, so also this is um, diff working on different um, on, the, on different um, landscapes actually. So here we have the impact landscape connecting economy, environment and society. So regeneration is not just something that we 
focus on and natural systems and ecosystems or agriculture it's something that we also can look at ourselves as um, human beings we can regenerate ourselves and how we uh, interact with ourselves how we interact with society so regenerative agriculture is something where we can learn from to actually evolve as a society and um, yeah bring us together to nature but also bring us together as people and with ourselves um, so we as climate farmers and also um, with the regenerative agriculture bring together people we are building the bridge between the separation before you were speaking about biological farmers conventional farmers industrial farmers regenerative farmers we want to see them as human beings interconnected working together um, to actually change something in the world to create a future where we can all live um, this uh, um, slide also just like shows you the different approaches that we have. So we have conventional, regenerative and organic farming and also regenerative organic farming. And um, here you just see the different tools that are used um, and how they are considered in society as uh, different. But as mentioned before, regenerative agriculture, as also seen here, is looking at the outcome. Um, so you can even apply conventional practices or com considered as conventional practices, but that lead towards regeneration. So this is what we want to bring out to society. Regenerative agriculture is an outcome based definition where we look at the results that you create in your ecosystem. And how can you support on an individual base? You can support companies who advocate for regenerative farming. You can buy local and organic. You plant, can plant a tree, but uh, don't just like plant a tree or forest in a monoculture way. Uh, look at the uh, holistic context and uh, plant a tree that fits to the specific context and to your ecosystem. And grow your own produce, so grow your own veggies and fr uh, fruits and also um, whatever you want to um, harvest. Then avoid products from corn and soy when possible, which is sourced from outside. There's regenerative soy and regenerative corn but um, at the moment, you, you sub or a lot of in the society is substitute, uh, uh, subsidized with actually corn and soy that is like still produced in a monoculture way. And so we try to live um, re regenerative life, but then actually we source it from uh, monoculture sources. Uh, donate to regenerative farming nonprofits and re research organizations. So actually interact with um, the, uh, the nonprofits and also um, people supporting regenerative agriculture in the scene. Purchase, uh, purchase regenerative clothing. So there's actually not just about the things that we eat, but also the things that we wear that are regenerative. So hemp, linen, organic cotton, climate benef uh, beneficial wool that are all sourced from regenerative um, agricultures. And this is like a way how you can support regenerative agriculture on a global scale. Uh, interact with natural systems and soils. Uh, I see this always like one of the main solutions. If you go into nature and you attack with nature, you're gonna be connected with nature and you can feel actually that uh, we should act out of love and not uh, act out of fear. And this should be one of the guidelines here. If you cons uh, consume animals, animal products, buy 100% uh, grass feed um, bee beef, buy pasture raised chicken and pork, and by eggs from free range and pasture, pasture raised um, laying hands. So these are just some of the things that you can do in your personal life to actually support regenerative agriculture, support the farmers, appreciate their work and interact with them. And we at Climate Farmers, we also create an open source community. So uh, you're free to join. Um, our focus is on machine learning, satellite imagery, but we also um, yeah, work on the communication moderation part with project management. We um, have a lot of soil science integrated into, into our work and software development. So you can always reach out to me and um, yeah, feel free to join the movement, share the word with uh, your community, um, buy from your local farmer and um, yeah, look at regenerative agriculture a little, more, a little bit more in depth because it can solve some problems out here. Thank you so much. Great, Fabio. Super good, super interesting. Thank you for this. This is great. And um, yeah, um, we will. I've I've seen many questions, um, or also many around um, actually consuming animal products or, or not. Um, so I'm excited to dive into this discussion um, with you after after the next presentation. Um, thank you, everybody, already for. Um, 
you know, sharing your thoughts on this and asking the questions already. We're, we're saving them right now. Um, but we will continue right now with Nick Jacobs. Um, Nick, can, do, can you share your presentation already? Sorry, there's so many people on the screen. I'm thrilled. Sure. Ah, there you are. Wonderful. Okay, I'll hand over to you. Uh, this is Nick Jacobs from IPES. Thanks very much, Anna-Marie. I'm just um, sharing that. You should see that on the full screen now. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to this discussion tonight. I'm going to be zooming out a bit from the previous presentation. I'll be talking about um, food systems as a whole and what do sustainable food systems look like and how do we get there. Um, first of all, to introduce my organization very briefly, IPES Food, the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. It's a network of 25 leading experts on food systems from really all different regions in the world. Uh, the panel brings together agronomists, sociologists, um, ecologists, political scientists, and experienced practitioners from civil society and social movements. So we have all these different types of knowledge brought together um, in order to really understand um, how to change food systems at the political level. Uh, given all the problems we're facing. And it's a panel that produces reports on the major issues facing our food systems, looking at a global level, but we've also done some work on, on the European level that I'll come back to in a moment. Um, Fabio already mentioned the planetary boundaries, and I won't go into lots of detail uh, to avoid boring you, but you know, before talking about the food systems that we want, it's important to understand the extent to which current industrial food systems are unsustainable and the the planetary boundaries framework lays out these nine um, key areas of environmental impact and it and where you see uh, the colors going into yellow or red that's where we're exceeding the safe operating space for humanity and we're going beyond what what the planet can sustain and what activity it can absorb and the areas where we're exceeding those boundaries um, to the greatest extent are due to agriculture. Biosphere integrity is, is relating to biodiversity loss, and that's primarily driven by the use of chemicals in agriculture. Down at the bottom, the, uh, the flows of phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, that's primarily driven by, by agriculture again, and particularly the use of fertilizers. Land use change, um, very much driven by deforestation, often to make space for agriculture. Um, so, so it's crystal clear that agriculture is really, in its current form, is driving the world's biggest environmental problems. And it's worth noting that these problems are a threat to agriculture itself. It's a vicious cycle. And the, the basis for producing food in the future is under threat if we're disrupting the, these fundamental flows and the, the health of our ecosystems. Um, sorry, oh, there we go. Next slide. Um, it's also worth noting that um, environmental problems are only one piece of, of the bigger problem here. And again, Fabio mentioned um, the, the different kind of impacts we're facing. Um, I, would, I would just draw attention first to the fact that food systems are not feeding people well. We have here 795 million people around the world suffering from hunger. The figure is actually higher now um, following COVID-19. Uh, 2 billion people with micronutrient deficiencies, 1.9 billion people who are obese or overweight and suffering, therefore, from, from diseases like diabetes and heart disease. Um, and, and if you look at the bottom right, there's a really crucial figure. 50% of the people who are going hungry around the world are actually small-scale farming communities. So this is a food system that is not even paying a fair price to the people producing food. Um, and, and when you look at all of these, these negative impacts together, the environmental, the social, the health impacts, the economic impacts, um, it's clear that we really need to change and thoroughly transform this whole system. We often hear, well, we can just produce more food with new technologies uh, to increase sustainability, but that's not going to provide micronutrients to the people who are lacking them. That's not necessarily going to get food to the poorest people who can't access it now even if food is, is abundant. And it's not going to ensure fair prices for farmers unless we really change the model, um, our food and farming model. Um, so 
we need a transformation of our food systems. We need a fundamentally different set of principles and incentives. And agroecology is that, that paradigm that we need. Um, we, we heard from Fabio about regenerative agriculture. And the first thing I'd say is that whether we're coming from the perspective of regenerative farming, organic farming, permaculture, they, there are people all over the world who you know, subscribing to these different terms referring to themselves in these different ways, but they're really going in the same direction. They're redesigning their production systems around ecological principles. And agroecology is a kind of umbrella term that we use at IPES Food, and we see many actors using now to describe this broad shift in our food systems that we need. Um, what does this mean on the ground? It's really about diversity at all levels. Um, Anna Marie mentioned agroforestry in the introduction. And, and certainly agroforestry systems are a key part of, of agroecology and part of the sustainable agriculture of the future. Um, these are systems where trees are, are intercropped with, with food crops, and those trees are able to draw down carbon from the atmosphere, as well as providing fertility to the soil, and even providing shade to crops as well. Um, mixed crop livestock systems are often, often um, seen as well. This is where you would have animals whose manure can be used to fertilize crops and those crops can be fed to animals as well or byproducts of those of those crops so this is again a very resource efficient system mixing different different types of production together polycultures where you have different um, varieties of crops grown together to to help fight pests and to to fertilize the soil uh, really the opposite of monocultures, which is the primary system we see now that's creating so many problems. So these, these are systems which essentially have a low or zero use of chemicals. Um, but agroecology is, tends to refer to something beyond the farm as well. It's a, real, it's a whole vision for the food system. And when you have this diversity of crops being grown, you'll also see traditional foods being revived and local food cultures um, kept alive that way. And having diversity in the field um, can often lead to diverse diets for local communities with, with a variety of health benefits. And when people are producing in these systems, they're not typically selling 100 tons of corn or wheat to a supermarket, right? This is a, a type of production system that goes hand in hand with different supply chains and different retail circuits. And often farmers um, coming from an agroecological perspective will be selling through farmers markets, community supported agriculture, selling directly to local authorities, the school canteens, um, any, any opportunities really to provide them with, with a decent price, a fair price for, for food that's being produced in this sustainable manner. So it's important to bear in mind that agroecology is not just an ideal. Um, the, these systems are already being put in place by farmers around the world, in Europe and in other regions, and they're already delivering major benefits for, benefits for people and for the planet. The clearest benefits, I think, are, are the environmental benefits. Um, as I mentioned, these are systems that, that really focus on diversifying production and, and creating healthy soils. And those are soils that are able to stop carbon. I won't go into any detail here. Fabio is the expert on that. But um, recent studies on agroforestry showed that you know, it's up to 40% more um, organic carbon stocks in soil in agroforestry systems relative to conventional production systems. Um, huge benefits for biodiversity when you're not producing with chemicals. Um, some comparisons show 50% you know, increases in biodiversity in organic fields versus conventional. And of course, major health benefits, partly from diversifying diets, also health benefits um, from lower exposure to pesticides. Uh, and, and crucially, these benefits are achieved without jeopardizing food security, without jeopardizing productivity. And actually these systems are productive because they're creating healthy soils, because they're keeping water in the soil. Um, and, they, and because they're bringing pollinators back to the land. So in, in some of the major comparisons that have been done, there have been fairly, fairly small yield differences between conventional organic production, um, slight decreases in production in developed countries, actually much higher yields in developing countries for organic versus conventional. 
Um, it's also important to note that um, the yields have been resilient to climate change. Um, in the wake of hurricanes or droughts, studies have shown that agroecological farms are able to recover more quickly because the fundamental condition of the soil and, and the ecosystem is better. And, and some recent studies have shown that these agroecological production does pay for farmers. Um, they may, might not be selling the same volumes of crops, but they're selling at a higher price when they find buyers who are you know, willing to pay that premium. And they save on costs because they're not paying for expensive seeds and fertilizers and, and pesticides. Um, a key question to ask then, and it's a question that we've asked in, in our reports is, you know, if, if the benefits of agroecology, the benefits of this transition are so clear, why is it not happening faster than it is already? And here I'm definitely not going to go into detail, but the, the diagram you see in front of you is um, eight, eight key obstacles that we identified to this transition to agroecology. Eight, we refer to them as lock-ins. These are, these are things that... Um, manifest themselves throughout the food system and prevent us making that shift to agroecology despite all of the negative impacts of our current industrial food systems. Right in the middle there you see concentration of power. Current systems are accruing so much value to big powerful companies and powerful agricultural lobbies. They're able to use that economic power, translate it into political power and lobby to keep the policies that, that suit them. And the key point really is that um, the current policies and incentives really favor industrial intensive production systems. And any success of agroecology so far is in spite of those policies, not because of them. And, and here we're referring to all sorts of things, some economic structures like the export orientation of our food systems, the fact that prices tend to be so low. Um, but some of the other obstacles here are really about the way that we make policies short-term thinking, the, the short-term electoral cycles that prevent us really thinking and supporting transitions, compartmentalized thinking, the fact that we have kind of agriculture policies, health policies, environment policies, all in their own silos. And the transition to agroecology could help meet the objectives of all these different policies, but we don't do it because we deal with them so separately. Um, so those are the kind of obstacles we've identified um, in a report we published in 2016. And I'd be happy to provide the link to that. So to, to wrap up, you know, bearing in mind all of these obstacles, how do we overcome them? And how do we spark this shift to agroecology in Europe and in the rest of the world, of course? Um, first of all, subsidy reform is unavoidable. We do need to change the cap. We need to reform the cap, even though it's such, a, such an uphill battle. Um, and we, we first and foremost need to stop supporting monocultures, stop supporting factory farms, for animal agriculture, and shift the majority of that money, if not all of that money, towards farmers who are doing regenerative agriculture, organic agriculture, farmers who are applying these principles of agroecology, but they're not getting rewarded for it. We have to make it pay for farmers to farm sustainably, rather than just telling them to do it and to face the burden themselves. Um, but it's not just about agriculture. And we also need new advisory services so farmers can be equipped with the knowledge to make that transition. We need new markets. Let's be realistic. If you're making this shift, you're not going to be supplying huge volumes to, to a major processor or supermarket, certainly not immediately. Um, so we need to provide support through school canteens and hospitals sourcing their food from these farmers by supporting the expansion of farmers markets, direct sales, and, and all other models that allow farmers to get a fair price for their produce. Um, and there's a huge role for the consumer as well. We need to make the healthy, sustainable choice the easiest for the consumer. How do we do that? We need to change so many things from marketing rules to taxation rules, even urban planning to make sure that healthy food options are available in each neighborhood. Um, so, so really the message here is that there's, there are lots of different things that have to change at the same time. Um, this is a transition across the whole food system, and, and it's time that we stop kind of telling farmers what to do and think about putting the incentives in place for a full transition across our food and farming systems. Um, reforming the cap is crucial, but it's not enough. We need a sustainable food policy. And um, this was a major project of IPES Food between 2016 and 2019. 
working with around 40 NGOs, social movements, scientific groups, we co-developed uh, a blueprint for a common food policy for Europe, a, a food policy that would drive forward this agricultural transition and transition to sustainable diets, uh, sustainable trade policy, all of these things at the same time. And the, the wheel that you see in this slide um, contains the 84 proposals that we put forward as part of that common food policy. And you're not expected to be able to read those here, but I'll be providing the link in the next slide uh, for anyone who's interested in hearing more about that. And of course, um, fo following that publication, we were happy to see the European Commission actually starting to talk about a farm to fork strategy. And that is certainly going in the direction of this of this more integrated, comprehensive approach to, to food system reform that, that we've been advocating for. So that's certainly a step in the right direction. I'll leave it there and I'm uh, looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. Very interesting um, also to have a um, kind of zoomed out perspective on sustainable food. Um, very interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and yeah, we've already had many, many questions um, in the chat. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Lucia, do you want to take over? Is there something you've seen? Should we? Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, I've, first of all, thank you so much to our amazing guest speakers. It's really been amazing. And also the way that you managed to break down complex um, information and made them so clear to all of us. Thank you so much for that again. It's been amazing. And thank you to everybody who wrote in the chat um, and have already shared some of their questions. Um, I will do the following. I will call out your name and I will give you the opportunity to ask your question yourself. That way you can also uh, yeah, give more details on what exactly it is that you want to know. Um, and if you don't feel 100% comfortable with that I completely understand that as well and then I will simply read out the question that you have uh, posed in the chat um, so we will start with uh, I believe it is Eddie would you like to pose your question yourself hello everyone um my question basically, uh, because I'm not very much into this subject, I'm very sorry if I sound a bit silly, but please forgive that. But I'm trying to understand anyway, because I live in a very, very wrong environment, and I know that, but uh, I don't see any change happening in Cyprus. Uh, so anyway, my question is, how do we counter uh, the economies of scale, those large conglomerates of corporations who are basically eating up all the pie of business i mean they're they're hugely funded and they're hugely networked as we all know they're global whereas uh we need to help small farming become more biodiverse so how, how can anybody even put any perspective on that thank you Fabio or Nick, any of you, uh, feel free. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could start. Um, and then I think Nick can better actually elaborate on it. Um, so what this is also a good question that uh, we focused at Climate Farmers a lot because there's a lot um, happening right now around the world where people claim to be regenerative. Everybody's using agroforestry. Everybody's like um, going towards how it used to be 10 years ago, sustainable. Now it's uh, being regenerative. So it's um, a greenwashing scheme happening around the world and a lot of companies organizations are going towards this direction and claiming that they're doing it and um, taking up the biggest pie uh, the biggest piece of the pie um, so what we saw what is actually super important at this moment is to be transparent so everything that we do is like um, being trustful and trustworthy with the society with our farmers and with our uh, measurements so <laughs> excuse me um so what we saw that um a lot of the claiming that big corporations and companies are doing there's nothing behind um, and they can't actually stand for their claims so we want to move towards more a, a more transparent and more um 
um, more understandable system where we as society and as consumers also understand what is behind all of this because at the end we make the decisions of what we are buying we are changing our habits we are the ones uh, leading to le leading the direction even if it's big corporates and the political system still we can make a change and this is like something if big corporates and if they are communicating something and we are just accepting it without asking actually what is behind all of this then uh, we got a problem here. So we said at Climate Farmers also, we want to work holistically. So if Nestle will approach us to work together with us, we will say no, because like this is not a holistic way to go forward. We should integrate all the different systems here. We should not just look at the agriculture system, but we should look at the whole life cycle assessment here. So if we have a product, we are looking at the different steps, how, how it's produced. Um, and like the different uh, value chains here and um, I think it's a very uh, difficult question that is I think not answered very easily but there needs to be a systemic change um, on a political level but also on, on an individual and organizational level so organizations should cooperate should push towards regeneration work together to support small-scale farming to support sustainable farming on, on a european global level and to work towards a trans transparent and trustworthy system where we as consumers can also understand what is happening and can um, yeah, can support these companies by also buying their products um, yeah, that's maybe from my side first. Nick, I guess you have a more in-depth uh, uh, answer on this. Well, it, it, it's a great question, Eddie. You're very modest. I mean, it's it's the problem we face in so many different sectors, isn't it? This this accumulation of power by by a small handful of people and companies. Um, just yeah, to to emphasize a different aspect, um, governance. Is so important, you know, the, the spaces where we make decisions globally, nationally, regionally, and um, kind of calling out lobbying when when it's very flagrant. Um, I think we, we need to keep doing that. You see some quite inspiring successes, and at the moment we're um, we're seeing the um, the food systems, the global food system summit will be taking place later in September. And this is um, something that was meant to be participatory, um, but NGOs and social movements have been st very strong in calling out um, the fact that the World Economic Forum was was one of the actors behind that. And that's that's you know a forum that represents the interests of some of the biggest corporations around the world, and they were involved in shaping this forum and shaping you know the way we're going to be talking about things. Um, and for that reason, NGOs around the world have rejected the summit, much to the embarrassment of the UN, and decided not to participate. And, you know, that's a step forward because um, we, we, need to, we need to be very clear when something is, is claiming to be in the public interest, but in fact, that there's a clear kind of private interest, interest of, of, of a very specific kind of handful of companies, very powerful companies um, being represented. I would also just emphasize again the the power and the potential of adopting kind of sustainable food policies or food strategies because you know when, when we look at the common agricultural policy in Europe um, we're really blocked vested interests have really captured that debate and it's so hard to move beyond it those interests are represented very well within say the agricultural committees or the agricultural ministries of different member states in the European Parliament if we shift to a food policy, you get different people around the table. Um, you, you would have to make decisions in more of a, you know, a cross-sectional committee where you have people coming from environment, health perspectives. And when you have those different perspectives in the room, you can't possibly justify the decisions we're making now, which really, you know, where we talk about the different priorities, but ultimately we make decisions based on the economic interests of the, of the big ag sector. Um, so, so I think, yeah, that's that's one avenue to challenge it is through through more democratic governance. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, Mackie nice. also had um, a couple of questions. I saw. I'm sorry, I skipped your first question. Uh, do you want to ask some of them yourself, or should I read them? Okay, um, so 
one of the questions was, is your goal not 100% plant-based agriculture? Until we abolish animal agriculture, we are not safe, least of all animals. Um, yeah, I also saw the discussion happening in the chat and um, I think it is a controversial topic in the society that we live in. Um, and as I also uh, showed the six principles of regenerative agriculture, so one of them is integrating livestock in uh, your management system. Um, if you eat it and if you actually consume uh, animal products, it's up to you. But regenerative agriculture tries to mimic nature as it is, to integrate um, uh, animals back into agriculture systems, but in a sustainable way of, um, of doing so. So there's actually the way how it is done at this current moment. It's, um, it's not very sustainable and um, it's de de degenerating ecosystems on a global scale. And um, I believe on a personal side um, that integrating it and um, leaving people together, uh, uh, leaving agriculture together with livestock management in a sustainable way is something that can also create a sustainable way of farming. Um, and that integrating livestock can actually also um, regenerate ecosystems as a whole. Um, yeah, I could I could add something quickly as well. I think it, it's really interesting to see how many people pick up on this question in so many different debates I'm part of actually that, that you know, something really passionate about. And I think it shows that, you know, even within, say, the, the converted or the, the movements of people who are, who are interested in, in fundamental change, there are big question marks still around this. And I think it's a necessary debate we need to have. I think I think there are some things that are really obvious and some things that are not. And, and certainly there's there's really no justification for factory farming, for intensive farming of animals. When you look at the suffering to the animals, uh, the impact on health, the spread of antimicrobial resistance, the diseases coming out of it, there's really no way to justify that. And the only reason it still exists, I think, is because the, the big um, meat companies have been effective in in scaring people and suggesting that the price of meat will will rocket if, if they don't continue to produce meat in that way. And that's really blocked change. Um, but you know, you have to bear in mind within the livestock sector, there's a huge range of impact, maybe a bigger range than, than for any other sector, um, between the, the impacts of those very industrial settings and, and the impacts and implications of a kind of small scale farm in a marginal territory, mountainous area, maybe where there's, where there's really very few other economic activities and where it might be a fairly uh, efficient use of, of the land and resources. Um, and certainly in other parts of the world, um, their livestock is really the only economic opportunity for, for a lot of populations, you know, short of some economic miracle that, that's not really gonna happen. Um, so, so we just have to be careful with generalizations and we have to be aware that the world we live in, if we say livestock is bad, it doesn't mean that we're all going to then, you know, and if we put a huge tax on meat, I don't think that means everybody is going to shift to a very healthy, diverse diet with lentils and chickpeas and, and more vegetables. The world we live in is full of marketing and, and very powerful companies. And that shift, I think, will, if it happens too quickly, will be towards very highly processed um, substitute products or maybe lab meat, um, for which the impacts are still not that clear and, and could, in fact, be higher and more damaging than the impacts of, of animal agriculture in some cases. So there's just some nuance needed there. Um, and it, it's a difficult one because of course, we need to reduce the total number of animals being farmed in the world, even just the feed that's required to, to you know, to, to feed those animals uh, is, is not sustainable. That, that's land that needs to be used for producing food for people fundamentally. Um, but it's not the same transition that has to happen everywhere. I don't think, um, I don't think we move the debate forward in a good way if we um, have a very black and white approach to it. Thank you so much. Um, I see that Julieta has her, raise, her hand raised. Um, would you like to ask your question? Uh, thank you. I'm, uh, first of all, I would like, uh, I suppose both, um, uh, both of you uh, have um, mentioned 
some um, uh, information in underlying studies. And um, I have been uh, searching for some times on uh, 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 scientific papers or even uh, uh, reports uh, that measure or quantify the, um, the animal health, uh, the biodiversity and the soil health, plant health, health benefits. Um, so if you can, um, uh, can give us some uh, links or sources, uh, I would be grateful. Uh, another question um, is, uh, what is the place of natural um, uh, animal and the plant communities in, in uh, agroforestry? By this, I mean, for example, um, what about the farmland birds? Have you been uh, studying those natural communities? Because I suppose that uh, uh, this concept of agroforestry would um, further gain, uh, um, gain more visibility if, uh, if uh, that, um, that value for natural communities would be uh, further uh, explained. Uh, another last question, if I, if I can, <laughs> can I? Thank you. Um, is that um, um, this agriculture, I suppose, is mainly seen as a small scale or even a subsistence, subsistence agriculture. Um, but uh, most governments, I suppose, <laughs> or all of them, uh, rather favor the industrial model. Uh, like for example, um, um, now um, it's uh, quite uh, in fashion, the wild berries. So the farmers all rush to produce wild berries or avocado uh, given it's uh, like uh, miraculous uh, benefits for human health. And this is just uh, uh, giving us uh, problems of um, uh, monocultures and uh, many agriculture fields that are totally uh, um, not adjusted to the regions. Um, do you have sort of, uh, how could you explain if uh, agroforestry is an agriculture that is also compatible or not uh, with um, this uh, general model of uh, the profit, uh, raw incomes, exportations uh, issues? And thank you. And sorry for so many questions. I, I, I can jump in first um, on this one. Thanks, Julieta. Really, really interesting stuff. I think um, for the first question was the easiest. Yes, I can recommend some good studies on this, including ones from my own organization, but some others as well. Um, on the question on farmland birds, I don't, I'm not familiar with specific studies on that. Um, I think it's it's something that needs to be studied because you know, you have, for example, palm oil production in Asia that's planting trees but it's not good for diversity. It's not good for biodiversity, probably not very good for birds, I'm guessing, because it's a monoculture system. And there's, that's not really been done with um, that in mind. Um, in agroforestry systems, if it's done properly, um, and, and often, you know, these would be fairly small plots of land. This is not, there's, I don't think anyone in the agroecology movement is advocating for having, you know, a huge agroforestry project across a whole region. Um, because that's when you start to encounter problems, when you have a, um, an, an artificial environment that doesn't provide habitats for birds and other species, and insects as well. So, so absolutely, those, you know, that, those are the problems that, that we need to avoid. And I hope there's studies being done on that. On the scale, um, does this only work on a, on a small scale, I think was the question. Um, no, I, th I think often sustainable agriculture and um, regenerative or, or agroecology is seen as something that, you know, it's just, just for small farms or subsistence farms. 
Um, and, and often actually in Europe, we see European policymakers propagating that because they talk about agroecology as a solution for small farmers in Africa, rather than actually supporting European farmers who might have bigger plots of land to make that transition. Um, no, we're, from our perspective, it's absolutely, uh, the, these solutions work at all different scales. It's perhaps more difficult sometimes for very large scale farms to make the transition because they've invested so much in producing a specific crop, right? They've bought specific equipment, even digital services now that are, that are tied to producing a very specific crop um, at, at scale. So it's, so it's harder to make that shift, um, but, but just as necessary. And we need to find the right incentives to make that work. Um, and and I, there's a very interesting example you made about all the farmers producing berries at the same time. Um, this, this is just a massive market failure and we need to have better information going to farmers. They don't do this. Um, and, and quite often the problem I think is government incentives where they will really encourage farmers through economic incentives or, or the information they're given um, to shift into certain sectors without thinking about the, the longer term impacts on sustainability. Um, so yeah, so big, big problems to, to solve there. Yeah, um, I think I just agree with what Nick said. Um, I, so for your first question, um, the measuring actually bird diversity and tools to use um, in order to see actually how much biodiversity in birds um, we have increased. There's this nice um, standard from the e from Savory Institute, and it's called ecological outcome verification which is like a local indicator to identify what is actually happening on the ground and to integrate this into um, looking at the results and the um, outcome that we are having. Another system that we at Climate Farmers also look at, which is um, very interesting and um, for the techies uh, under you, um, something to look deeper in is Fault AI, um, which is they are integrating microphones on the land um, in order to track biodiversity and to create uh, biodiversity indicators that can track um, sounds that can, we can't hear as human beings, um, but which are identifying birds, insects. And um, this is a great solution actually for identifying what is happening on the ground and for tracking biodiversity and um, seeing also which uh, birds we have for the question if we actually can scale it and if we can um, yeah, feed the world with it. Um, there is a nice study. Um, I'm just going to share some links with you uh, to also look deeper into what is happening in the academic world. Um, so this is like um, a nice uh, paper that is actually looking at the productivity of um, regenerative um, farms on a larger scale and is comparing them with conventional farms. So this paper is one of the examples, actually, how we can scale this system up and how we can um, have integrated agri agroforestry or, or practices that are considered as uh, small scale farming practices applied on larger scale and actually um, producing a lot of um, yield and feeding a lot of uh, a big part of community and um, with a sustainable way of farming and um, this is something that was not proven years before but now um, academic institution research paper are going towards the direction of actually proving that regenerative agriculture that is considered as a romantic way of farming can be something that we can actually uh, scale and that we can use um, for uh, showing the benefits and the regeneration um, on a larger scale. There's one example um, that I took already, um, the farmer with the 700 hectare. Um, so he's actually looking deeper into um, agro agroforestry and like how to implement for um, um, trees in his, on his land. And uh, he found out that th this is not a big problem for his monoculture farm. So now he's also going to implement um, forests and that are considered it as an agroforest system on his uh, 700 hectares. So this is one of the examples actually that, that of the steps that people take actually to move forward. Um, and yeah. Uh, thanks for those great questions. They were great. Thank you so much. Um, next up, Anna, would you like to ask your question yourself or should I read it up the chat? Uh, I, I can ask my, my question myself. Thank you very much. So my initial question was really uh, in regards to what are the best ways to determine what plants work 
together, our best together in agroforestry. And uh, whether it's in the same field or within rotation, but ultimately it, it, it really is, is how can small farmers like myself, like educate, our sm educate ourselves and where can we go globally for knowledge and help? Um, for the diversity of crop diversity and which um, plants actually to connect, um, I think there's not one solution that fits all. Like it also depends on your context and what you want to produce. Actually, there's a lot of companion plants or plants that work together um, that you can use for specific climate zones and um, also that are adaptive adapted to different climate zones and can be always combined. Um, so it always depends on what do you want to produce and um, like what is your specific context, where do you live, what's your location and what are your needs. Um, and this is connected to your second question, where to get actually the knowledge and how to learn from it. And um, this is what we want to do with the climate, with climate farmers and the Climate Farmers Academy. Um, I'm going to share the link uh, to the Climate Farmers Academy with all of you, where we have a collection, a library of knowledge, actually, that is supporting you in your decision making. It's up to you what to do, because um, we believe that um, we should make farmers aut aut autonomous ag again, so self-dependent, not depending on us. They should be self-dependent and um, create their own solutions. But we can help you to create a guideline to move forward. Um, so we have different sources. We can connect uh, farmers worldwide. And what we do with the pharma, Climate Farmers Library is actually to um, yes, um, collect different knowledge and bring it out to people like you who are working on a small scale, who want to interconnect with people around you and to learn also from people, farmers that are applying different practices in your specific climate zone. And uh, this is the overall goal where I would also encourage you learn from the farmers, interact with the farmers that are surrounding you, get in touch with them and see also what works for them. Most of them are very collaborative. And, um, this is something where I would also push forward and um, encourage all of you to um, look as um, agriculture systems as kind of a cooperative system. Um, we shouldn't also compete in the agriculture system. We should work together. And um, yeah, I. I can, I'm going to send the link to the Climate Farmers Academy and um, check on Instagram, check on uh, online if you can find farmers around you, learn from them, interact with them, but also reach out to us and we give you the right source and the right connection. And I don't know if Nick has something to uh, elaborate on. No, that was that was very complete. I think I think nothing to add here. Thank you so much. Naden, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I wanted to ask something. None of you mentioned it, so it's probably not a thing actually, but I wondered whether through, well, additional technology, there is scope for polycultures, mixed cultures, which in an attempt to emulate natural communities actually um, provide space for more animals and natural ecosystem. And the other thing is whether actually timber production is also part of the concept of uh, agroforestry, uh, agro, well, whatever it was, agroforestry. No. Um, I can start that on the second point. Yes, absolutely. I think timber often is um, a market that, that people will use in it and a key part of the economic equation to make to make agroforestry viable. But of course, um, people won't be chopping down trees every day and that, that has to be done in a sustainable manner. Um, the, the other question, I'm not sure I fully understood. Um, I think you're, you're asking whether like sort of new technologies, sort of digital technologies can be used to design a mix of crops to be grown together in polyculture, is that right? If that, if that is the case, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have knowledge on that, on specific technologies um, that can do that. Um, I, what we do know is that polycultures are, are really effective. It's a, it's a key part of, of a kind of diversified production system. And, you know, it's, it's difficult for farmers to go in that direction because it's not the typical way that farming is, is advocated, but, um, but certainly important. So it could perhaps be useful to have, have support for farmers uh, wanting to do that. 
Yeah, I would agree on this. Um, so whatever we consume, whatever we have um, as human beings can be produced on a regenerative way. So timber is something that is also included in um, agroforestry, silver pasture and regenerative agriculture as a whole. And um, there are great projects actually um, sourcing uh, timber from regenerative sources. And um, to the first question, I'm also afraid I don't, I, have, I don't have like a solution for this or an answer for this, but I believe that uh, this is possible and there's like companies doing it. Um, polyculture as also mentioned as one of the principles for regenerative agriculture is um, yeah the main focus to go away from monoculture um, cultivation and actually introduce diverse systems on a plant base, but also um, on the way how we interact with the plants. Yeah, I hope uh, this was uh, yeah uh, a solution for you. Thanks for the question. Good. Um, okay, so Jerowyn wanted to know about uh, vertical farming, which was mentioned. Um, so it's obviously a great um, opportunity we have there, but what are the opportunities or the drawbacks of this approach? You want to go first, Nick? I was hoping you would. Um, I, I'll, I'll start by saying I don't know a great deal about vertical farming. Um, I think that the first thing to say is that we have so many solutions already um, on the ground and farmers around the world are wanting to make this transition. They want to be given the tools and the support to do it. So I think it must be quite frustrating for, for farmers who are waiting for their government to give them that support when they hear about you know, multi-million dollar investments in, in a vertical farm. Um, there, you know, there may be some specific cases. Um, you know, Singapore is a good example, right? Where it's um, a place that, that really doesn't have much agricultural land at all. So for the, for the purposes of their own food security, um, it might make sense to, to farm vertically to farm wherever they can using new technologies, right? But in other parts of the world where we have rural areas that we want to stay alive, we, we want to ensure economic activities in those areas, we have farmers willing to farm. Um, I think it makes sense to, to, to start there and to do, because we really have barely begun the transition kind of on the soil. Um, and and it's, you know, it's, it's always very, um, tempting I think for policymakers to go for these big silver bullet solutions and there's a lot of discussion now about lab-based meat also lab-based food production in general um, and and some kind of assumption that we can just produce food under these synthetic conditions and and magically get you know nutritious food but it's going to take energy and water and, and other inputs um, and, and you may end up kind of using the same amount of resources um, and all you've achieved is just to kill the livelihoods of, of millions of people around the world. Um, so so I, think, I think vertical farming, I think, yeah, <laughs> in, in answering the question, I've realized I certainly see more risks than, than benefits, um, but, but let's start with agriculture and fixing it. Yeah, I agree here. Um, so I think vertical farming is a great solution in a, a, or can be used in urban areas and urban spaces in order to also produce on a, large, on a smaller scale, but to actually um, create a sustainable way or a sustainable um, farming system globally, we should focus on working with the soil and actually um, bringing fertility and health back to our soils that are surrounding us and creating awareness about this. Um, and vertical farming is, that doesn't exclude this, um, but if we go um, towards a more innovative technology and uh, creating systems that go uh, take us away from nature, and then I th see also much problems here. Um, but I think, or I believe on a personal side, that uh, vertical farming can be used in a nice and sustainable way. And um, and also in an urban space, I've seen seen great projects. Um, but yeah. I uh, also see regenerative agriculture focusing more on land and um, on uh, urban, uh, outside of urban spaces. It can be also small scale urban spaces and urban gardens, um, but something where we interact with soils and create systems that are happening also in nature. 
And I think um, we have maybe time for, for one more question. Um, I love that we had the opportunity to really um, dive into your questions and hear, um, hear what you're thinking and um, to see how interested you are. And just to let you know, we will, um, as mentioned earlier, we're recording this. We will put this um, webinar up on YouTube um, and then send you the link to it um, um, probably next week. And we will aim to make a collection of the different links you've sent as well. Uh, links to IPES, links to climate farmers and to some of the studies you shared so that you um, can then have them all um, in one email and um, have a little bit more time to, to look at all the data that people shared today. And then, um, yeah, Lucia, if you have maybe pick one more question or is there somebody else who wanted to ask something? I saw uh, one question by Maria. Would you like to... Ask that yourself. If not, I can ask it for her. Uh, Maria wanted to know whether there are already some numbers or maps where regenerative uh, agriculture is at work. So some examples that we can see around the globe. Yes, thank you. I did not realize uh, you were calling me. Yes, yes, I'm so you. sorry. <laughs> That's my question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, so there is the, um, so we highlight actually the work that we do with climate farmers um, with the profiles that we created. So we put into focus um, different farming um, systems around Europe and highlight their contribution towards climate, mit climate change mitigation, but also their contribution in uh, producing food for us. Um, so this is like one um, example of actually how regenerative agriculture can work and um, yeah, uh, highlighting just the work also of um, farmers around you and in your neighborhood, which is also important. Um, so we have YouTube and you can find, for example, Richard Perkins, who's in Sweden. Um, he's one of the great examples how regenerative agriculture can work on a smaller scale, but still producing a lot of yield. Um, what we do with the climate farmers profiles is actually to bring farmers around you uh, in touch with you and actually uh, bring them closer um, to you and, and their work and yeah, seeing them as uh, the ones that are fighting climate change for all of us and um, they are doing actually a great work and um, you can find YouTube, YouTube videos um, on our climate, climate farmers page that are highlighting the work of these farmers and uh, showing you like a more video insights of uh, their work. Um, I'm going to also um, check through the chat afterwards and uh, I saw there were some links asked for timber and um, also for some sources um, regarding knowledge um, and we can send them out afterwards um, in the follow up email. Yeah, there, there are some great sources out there on this. Um, if, if you go to the IPES food website of our organization, that's IPES-food.org, um, there's a tab at the top from, with a map. And um, through that map, you can click on some case studies um, of farmers and communities, even regions that have sort of transitioned towards agroecology and regenerative farming. Um, so, so those are case studies. Um, that go into detail on, on some of these different experiences. It's not an exhaustive map of everybody doing this around the world, but that might, might be of interest. There's also an initiative called Beacons of Hope that's gathering case studies of, of transition as well. So um, that's a couple of resources to get started. Excellent. Um, we're right on time. I'm very impressed. Um, I'm sure there's um, probably more questions. Um, you can always um, reply to us as well to the invite that you got. Um, uh, write to me, um, which is a botsky. I'll just share it as well here at wemove.eu. Um, but you will also, as mentioned, get the email next week, um, and then um, you'll have a lot of information. And um, from my side, from the WeMove side, also just um, 
wonderful to see you and to meet you in person. We sent a lot of emails out um, and your support really means um, the world to us. We have really impacted uh, a lot of policies together. Um, you've really supported so many of our campaigns, um, not just our, um, agriculture campaigns. Um, and it's just um, great to see you in person um, and not just uh, your name on the on the email. Although I know David um, Schwartz usually writes to, um, to you on the English list. Um, but yeah, I just hope um, also that it was for you interesting to see some other faces from across Europe and to connect um, over this topic. And um, so, yeah, I just um, want to thank again our speakers as well. Um, Fabio, thank you so much for, uh, for stepping in um, and doing such a great presentation. And Nick as well to share all your knowledge uh, on sustainable um, food. It's um, really interesting. Um, Lucia, thank you so much for helping out uh, and engaging the community. And for all of you that took the time tonight, um, I hope this was uh, helpful. I uh, hope it sparked some interesting ideas. I uh, hope um, these ideas travel further and that we get a chance to connect. Um, and yes, I wish you all a great evening. Um, please just send an email if you have any more questions. And